Hey, what's up, guys? It's next time. I've been playing Celeste, and wow, what a game. Just mwah. It blends story and gameplay together very well by conveying some serious emotions while keeping the quality of the gameplay high. There's games out there that focus just on story, like Inside, or just on gameplay, like Mario. There's even games that have good story and good gameplay, but are unable to bridge the gap between them, like Dead Space. And then there's Celeste, a game whose story directly impacts the gameplay, giving each section weight and making each level feel important. They nailed the difficulty curve. The music highlights the setting, the story is rather relatable, and the collectibles are fun in the game. The strawberries were by far my favorite collectibles, but the more I thought about them, the more I felt that they were seriously underdeveloped, and the more it became apparent that they were fighting with crystal hearts and cassettes for a place in this game. In this video, I want to talk about some of the shortcomings I noticed with the berries, and how I believe we can fix some of these issues in a satisfying way. This is your spoiler warning. In order to explain some design issues with the berries, I'll have to talk about their placement throughout the entire game. I highly recommend you play the game before watching this video. You won't regret it. You're introduced to the berries on the second screen of chapter 1, so you're clued in that they're more or less the main collectibles in the game. This berry is clearly visible in the main path. All you have to do is take an extra step in order to get it. The second berry you see is in the third screen of chapter 1, and it's in a much more dangerous area compared to the first berry. Despite it being within arm's reach, its placement suggests that they're not always going to be easy to get, which is essentially the point of the berries. Metaphorically speaking, in my opinion, the strawberries represent a self-imposed challenge for the player to seek out and take on. Their extra little challenge levels generously sprinkled throughout the main campaign of the game. A lot of these berries are fun to collect, and this is where we start to see the first issue with these berries is that some berries are overtly frustrating to collect. I've categorized the berry placements into three main types. You got your main path berries, your side path berries, and your Zelda Seeker berries. The main path berries are those that you find while going through the main path of the game. They're the easiest to find and are usually in a corner somewhere. To my knowledge, chapter three is the best example of this because of how many main path berries there are. It feels like almost every screen you walk through, you can either walk past the main path berry or spend some time trying to collect it. These, in my opinion, are the best ones in the game. The challenge is clear and alluring. Side path berries are berries that have an entire screen dedicated to them and are off the main path to complete the game. To my knowledge, chapter one is the best example of this because you can clearly see these branching paths and taking the time to explore those paths reveals the side berry challenge as the reward. These two types of berries are fun and clear for the player. It's the Zelda Seeker berries that make berry hunting frustrating. Zelda Seeker berries are berries that require the player to do something obtuse or arbitrary in order to find them. These Zelda Seeker berries vary between breaking what looks like a non-breakable wall to falling into seeming death pits to reveal a would-be side path berry that was hidden away behind a Zelda Seeker gate. Strawberry hunting these berries was way more frustrating than it needed to be. The only clue you get as to where they might be is this buried timeline the player has access to when you hit pause on your second playthrough of the chapter. This timeline lights up a red dot if you've collected a berry, a blue dot if you've collected a berry in a previous run, and a dash if you've never gotten that berry at all. I don't remember the game telling me this timeline is a thing, so I want to say I stumbled upon it while looking for the berries. After a few chapters of using this timeline, I came to the conclusion that it's both useful and incomplete. For example, every berry is on this timeline in the correct order, meaning that if you find one berry, miss the second one, and find the third berry, then you know the second berry is somewhere between the first and third berry. The incomplete information arises after your first run, when you come back. The game doesn't tell you which berry it is you've collected in the timeline, they just appear as blue dots. What ends up happening then is that you're forced to recollect berries you've already collected just to see where they land in the timeline. This is bad design because if I had known better, I wouldn't have bothered with the berries until my second run of the chapter when I have the berry timeline available to me. That way, I'll only have to collect a berry once and I'll know more or less where the other berries I missed fall in the space of the chapter. To fix this, I would suggest maybe numbering the berries in the timeline so you know which ones you are missing and that Celeste also numbers the berries in the level 
so you don't have to recollect it and check the timeline to see which one it is. It was a combination of this clue system and how tedious the Zelda secret berries were that drove me to use the berry guide instead of wasting my time trying to find the berries myself. Consider this Zelda secret berry. You have to jump into what looks like a death pit to reveal this berry. And not only this, you have to jump into a second death pit in order to find the second berry hidden in chapter 7. Hiding berries in seeming death pits isn't fun. It adds needless deaths to my death counter because now I'm trained to constantly jump into every death pit I see just to see if there's a berry in there or not. Consider this other Zelda secret berry. This one is in chapter 5 and it's also in a death pit. I played this section several times over in the dark because I didn't even know there was a death pit for me to jump into. It's only after talking to Theo that the level lights up and you can see more of the level around you. The problem is that I came through here in the dark, so I never considered there being a berry here even though I had spent close to an hour looking for it. To top it off, I was very annoyed that finding this berry took way longer than it did to collect. It's this kind of design that made me consider that Zelda Sheikah berries were disrespectful to the player's time. Arbitrarily making the berries obtuse to find for no reason is rude. Consider this last Zelda Sheikah berry I'll show. It's self-aware that finding this berry was the challenge because as soon as you touch it, you claim it. That's not how other berries work in the game. Regular berries forced you to get to safety before you can claim the berry. How is this not the case with this Zelda Seeker berry? Why is it that some are incredibly obtuse to find and then let you claim it once you find them? In my opinion, these berries got to go. They're disrespectful to the player's time and have no value in the game other than to pad the runtime of berry hunting. If you want to keep the berries, then I recommend adding some visual cue for the player to look out for. Some Zelda Secret Berries do this, but it's not a thing across the board, which I think is a mistake. If the creator of Celeste, Maddie, doesn't want to change these berries, then I think keeping them is a mistake. I can almost hear you guys saying, but Thinktanium, the berries are optional. At the beginning of the game, the start of chapter 2, the game explicitly tells you these berries are optional. This might be true, but I don't think they're optional since the ending of the game is determined by how many berries you manage to collect. Optional, to me, means optional, meaning that nothing happens if you get it or not. Tying the ending of the game to something that's optional doesn't feel like that thing is optional anymore. What's worse is that there's a bad ending if you don't collect at least 20 berries. It ends with Madeline baking a crummy pie and everybody being awkward about it. I know that collecting at least 20 berries in this game is very reasonable, but the fact that this ending exists, I think, goes completely against the spirit of the game. Consider the context. You just climbed Celeste, something that even a part of Madeline didn't think she could do. This is a momentous occasion for her, and to end it with what's essentially a slap to the player's face for not collecting enough of those berries, the game went out of its way to tell you were optional, I think grossly misses the point. One of these has got to go. Either the multiple endings don't hinge on the berries, or the postcard doesn't tell you that they're optional. I recommend the second option of changing the postcard because I think the berries have a lot of potential. They're not just to impress your friends. They feel like they show how dedicated a player is to challenging themselves. This leads me to my third point I want to make. After the main campaign, the game offers an optional chapter 8 and chapter 9 and B-side levels and C-side levels for the player to chew on. B-side levels are unlocked by collecting these adorable little cassettes in each chapter. They are remixed harder levels of that chapter's theme. I like these levels, but I disagree with how they're unlocked. Collecting one cassette in a chapter chock full of berries to unlock the B-side levels doesn't fit the design of the game for me. If you ask me, what better way is there to reward players who went out of their way to challenge themselves to collect all the berries? You give them harder levels. It's at this point I started to consider that the strawberries were just a cute idea Maddie had when she was writing Celeste on the Picoway console. They're cute, they're fun, and that's about it. I mean, to unlock harder levels, you just have to collect the one cassette and not bother with the berries at all. They don't bring anything to the table except the ending of the game. Because of this, I recommend getting rid of the cassettes and make the reward for collecting all the berries in that chapter be the B-side levels. You can even keep the name B-side levels for berries. And since real cassettes don't have C-sides either, you can keep the C-sides names as well. 
If you jump into chapters 8 and 9, you're hit with this barrier that only unlocks if you collect enough crystal hearts in the game. Blue crystal hearts can be collected in the A sides, red crystal hearts can be collected by completing the B side levels, and the yellow crystal hearts are collected by completing the C side levels. These barriers to me really cemented the idea that the barriers were just a cute idea and that they're not the main collectible in the game. The hearts are. Which is a bit conflicting to me because the strawberries are the first collectible thing we see in this game. The winged strawberry is in Selex's box art. The Steam store page also shows this graphic. Not cassettes and not crystal hearts. So it's conflicting to me to see the strawberries take such a back seat in the game and for crystal hearts to take on such a big role. This was even more confusing to me when I realized that berries and crystal hearts function effectively the same way. When you complete a B-side level, you're rewarded with a red crystal heart. That's essentially a badge or a proof that you went out of your way to challenge yourself. The same thing is true with the yellow hearts. They're behind three super heart screens, and when you get them, they appear in your save file ticket. So it's clear that the idea of taking on self-imposed challenges are represented in two different ways in the game the berries, and the crystal hearts. When it comes to these barriers, the amount of crystal hearts is essentially the game asking the player for a skill check. The game is saying, are you ready for what's ahead? No, no really, I'm serious. You won't have a good time if you haven't done some b-sides. And then the game looks at your crystal hearts and decides whether or not to let you in. Because the crystal hearts and barriers represent the same thing, I recommend using the berries instead of the crystal hearts to unlock chapters 8 and chapters 9. If we already use them to unlock the b-side levels, then it's not a big stretch that they also unlock these later chapters. Now I know these are a lot of changes I'm recommending to the game, and that's only because I feel the strawberries embody the spirit of the game so much. They're a self-imposed challenge. B-side levels aren't part of the main game, neither are c-side levels, or chapters 8 or chapters 9 for that matter. The credits roll after chapter 7, so it's fair to say that everything else is optional, but people still choose to do them anyways, which is why I feel the strawberries should take a bigger role than they currently do. Allow me to leave you with this. Personally, I define a complete game as a game that accomplishes what it's set out to do, and in many ways, Celeste feels like a complete game. Even with the cassettes and crystal hearts present in the game, they all effectively represent the same thing which is a self-imposed challenge. I only bring this up because just recently, at the time of this video, the creator Maddie came out and said that Madeline and Celeste is transgender. Personally, I don't think this adds or subtracts anything from Celeste, since her gender identity isn't the focus of the game. It's a game about mental health and dealing with anxiety. We all have that little voice in our heads that tells us we're not good enough, and even though it might be trying to protect us, its effects can be destructive and self-defeating. The main takeaway from this article that Maddie wrote for me was that she admitted that if she were to redo the game, she'd tell the story differently. In my opinion, the game feels complete, but if the creator doesn't, then all I can do is assume that the story we got was just a draft of what was intended, and it gives me hope that in the future, a retelling of Celeste will take place, told in the manner Maddie intended and making the game complete. It's at that point I hope that Maddie will take some of my recommendations into consideration in hopes of making the game better. As always, this is the start of a discussion. Do you think the strawberries should take center stage or do you think they're perfect the way they are? How would you design the strawberries? I grinded like maybe three golden strawberries and dude, uh, I don't think I'm up to like 100%ing this game. You have my respect if you can 100% this thing, man. I, uh, it was like two hours for... Chapter 1, B-Side, Golden Berry? Uh, no. That's it for now, and I'll see you guys next time.